So one of the things that we used to sell our grains into the conventional market. Now I'll never forget, 1999, I hauled a load of oats into the elevator. They offered me 99 cents a bushel. And I'm like, I begged for that extra penny to get a dollar a bushel, no way. 99 cents and I came home and I told my wife, that's it. I don't want to sell into that type of market again. Same with livestock, we used to sell at Sale Barn. Yeah, you can do a few things like get a uniform group, number ahead, etc. But you're really at the mercy of the market. Then you look at what's happening in production agriculture. Latest statistics I could find, 14 cents of every food dollar goes to the producer. 86 cents goes processing, marketing, etc. I want the 86 cents. I'm taking all the risk. Let them have the 14. No, as a matter of fact, I'll take that too. But, but you know, we don't get paid for the risk we take. So our whole mindset is we want to capture a larger percentage of that food dollar. And in order to do that, you really need to market as far up the chain as you can. One of the things my son and I spend a lot of time doing is understanding trends. And it always bothers me that, that farming and ranching is such a complex business, yet as producers we don't spend a lot of time looking at trends and where the industry's headed. You know, I mentioned earlier today that when I was in Nebraska there, the corn bean guys, they were going to plant corn and beans again. Well, to me that just doesn't make sense. So Paul and I spend time looking across trends, and there are certain trends you see no matter where you're at in production agriculture. One of them for sure is an increased emphasis on soil health. You know, that's the reason you're here today. You also see where nutrient runoffs being a major player that's driving a lot of the decisions being made on farms and ranches. Whether you're talking into the Chesapeake, the Great Lakes, the Mississippi Delta, or out uh, on the West Coast, it's the same thing. So there's these trends, and I'm not gonna go through them, all of them, but you see that across all agriculture. And then you also see what the consumers are looking at. And one of the things we pay a lot of attention to is what's driving consumers, what do they want to buy? And so there's a trend among the National Restaurant Association where they take a survey and they survey all these chefs and what are they saying they're looking for? Well, they want more grass-fed items. You know, the grass-fed beef industry has been growing at 25 to 30 percent per year for the last 15 plus years, and it's not slowing down. So that tells us, hey, that's an industry we want to be in. Natural and organic. Organic is grown at over a 20% clip per year. That's something you might want to take advantage of. Then the thing that really drives us, there's a real increased emphasis as food as health. And, you know, so often the mindset a lot of these commodity groups is, oh, we just have to educate the consumer. The consumers are educated to a great degree, and they're going to drive what we as producers do. So we pay attention to that. The nutrient density of our foods has decreased anywhere from 15 to 65 percent in the last 50 years. And it varies some. I don't care, though, whether you're talking vegetable production, meat production, grain production. It's all. It just stinks. And it's hard to find really good data on this. But it, it is out there. Consumers are not satisfied th with that. And that's why we're seeing them gravitate in large numbers towards uh, buying these products that are more natural, more organic, more grass-fed. So that means, because of this, we must focus on soil health. The only way you're going to increase nutrient density in foods is through a healthy soil. Because that's how the system works that plants uptake nutrients. So you saw, you know, Russell was a perfect example of that, that he has higher test weight. He has higher nutrient density in the crops he's producing because of his soil health. Now on our operation, we've started to spend quite a bit of time in looking at the nutrient density of the products we're producing. That's a sales point for us. The only way you can increase nutrient density is through soil health. So I showed you the map of our operation. The first thing one has to look at when he looks at his far or her farm or ranch as an ecosystem is what do you have available to you? Land, genetics, dollars, people, and that's what you work with. 
So on our place, I told you, we have the 2,000 acres of true native range. We have another 1,000 acres of our tame grass pastures. Much of that was in the conservation reserve program. And then there's cropland that we seeded back to perennials. And we have another 2,000 acres of cropland. So that's our land base. That's what we got to work with. Whatever you have, that's what you have to work with. How do you meld that together in an ecosystem? Now, this young guy here on the left, I claim him as my son. He's 6'4". My wife says it was a tall mailman, but that's another story. We knew from when my son was young that he'd want to come back and take over the operation. That's all he's done all his life is followed me around. Now, we have a daughter who's older than him, and she's married, and, and their family uh, lives uh, in a town in North Dakota there, and she decided she didn't want to be a part actively in the operation. So here's how I'm going to give you uh, how we decided to transfer the farm to the next generation. What we did is we formed a limited li family, limited liability, limited partnership. All the, the land, the cattle, the equipment, everything farm related is in that partnership. The deal we made with our son is for every year he's on the place after college, he gets 5% of that. So at the end of 20 years, he owns everything, and I'm working at Walmart. No, I joke about that. But then the, the ranch is his, and that's an easy transition. Now, if our daughter would have wanted to take an active part, we still could have done this. They would have, the shares would have just been split equitably between the two of them, but everything could still be in the partnership. It's an easy way to transition the operation. Because we're direct marketing, we're not going to put our farm or ranch at risk because somebody doesn't cook their pork long enough or whatever the case may be. So we formed Brown's Marketing LLC. This is a limited liability company of which we purposely set it up so our son owns 60% and my wife and I 40%. We did that because I think if you're really going to transfer things to the next generation, they need to learn business. So this is my son's business. It's how he's in charge of all of the, uh, the marketing end of it. Now our daughter has seen what's happened on the place now, and she's interested in, uh, in moving back to our hometown and taking more of an active role in the operation. So now we're going to transfer our shares in the marketing business to our daughter. So she'll be in partnership with our son on the marketing end of it. And she's, she's got the gift to gab like her dad, and she's a people person, so we think it's going to work real well. However, it's already in the agreement that if she goes to sell, he's got first right of refusal on any of it at current market value because we don't want him, uh, her to be able to sell some, to someone else if there was friction between the two of them. But there's ways you can set this up. So what the marketing business does is like anything from the farm that we want to market, it's purchased by the marketing business. Checks are wrote. Everything's legal above, you know, you have to have a paper trail and make it legal. And the LLC purchases it from the triple LP. That washes the triple LP's hand of any liability. And then the marketing business adds value and directs market. So our mindset, we're very conservative when it comes to spending but we're very open-minded when it comes to new ideas and how do we regenerate our operation holistically and transfer it to the next generation. Put this saying in there again because it just fits so perfectly. I don't care whether we're talking production or marketing. If you want to make small changes, change the way you do things. If you want to make major changes, change the way you see things. That really comes to play when we work at developing our own markets to capture more of the food dollar. You know, you heard what Russell's doing with things such as his distillery, with things such as those, those heirloom type grains. That's the way we need to think. We're kidding ourselves if we think commodity beef or pork or corn or beans or whatever crop is gonna change much in price. It's only gonna change when there's a major drought or some event like that. Otherwise, you got to create your own market and do things to add value. Don't be afraid of failure. I tell people, my son and I try hard every year to fail at several things. Because if we don't fail, that means we're not pushing the envelope. I, you know, I want to 
be out there and try other things. So don't be afraid of failures. You just make your failures small. We'll try some many things new every year, a different cover crop species, a different livestock, you know, different combinations of things. If they work, we'll, we'll accelerate it a little bit. If they don't work, we'll try them a second time, but in our place, two strikes and you're out. We've got too many things we want to uh, try, and I'm getting pretty old, so I don't have many years left. People laugh at me because I'm different. I laugh at them because they're all the same. I often get asked the question, how many of your neighbors are doing this? And I tell them that. I laugh, my neighbors laugh at me, I laugh at them, you know, because of what Russell showed you. You know, look at that. That's just mind-blowing what he did in five years' time, you know. And it was only because he was willing to step outside the box. You have to brand yourself. What makes your operation unique? What sets you apart? Are you organic? Or are you all natural? Are you non GMO, are you selling heirloom varieties? What are you doing differently? Why should they come by from you? You have to brand yourself. Showed you this before. I want everybody to know that I'm doing a different type of agriculture. We get asked all the time, are you organic? I said, no, I'm way above organic and beyond that. We're regenerative. To our knowledge, we've never ever lost a sale because we're not certified organic. Once we explain what we're doing, they buy. Plain and simple. Because we really believe that, because regenerative agriculture will put more nutrient density in foods. Now, would I love to be regenerative and organic? Sure. And I'm working towards that. Now, even saying that, though, I'm not going to be certified organic. I just refuse to do the paperwork like that. Now, besides that, what we've done to brand ourselves is this is our trademark label, Nourished by Nature. Everything we do gets that trademark label on it. We own that trademark. These are our customers now. We started with just direct marketing, and we've expanded from that. It's really interesting when you set up and direct market to people, though, you really get to find out what's driving consumers. The number one question we get asked, hands down, is where are you from? Where's your farm? They want to buy local. They want to know the food they're putting in Junior's mouth. Where did it come from? That's the number one thing. Second thing, hands down, or are you non-GMO? We can argue GMOs all you want. My customers are telling me they don't want me to grow any, and we haven't for years and years. There's no reason to, like Russell said. Yes, GMOs are a tool to be used, but we're to the point we don't need that tool, and our customers are telling us they don't want us to use that tool. Antibiotics and hormones, added antibiotics or hormones. We don't use any of them. The other thing which is really surprising Realize I'm in such an agricultural state in North Dakota. I thought everybody was in tune with, uh, with how animals are treated, but that's the fifth most asked question we get. How do you treat your animals? My son answers that. If I was a farm animal, I'd want to live on Brown's Ranch. I tell people our animals have one great life and then one bad day. That's how I answer it, but <laughs> works pretty good, you know. The other thing we do that's different from a lot of producers is we have an open door policy. Any of our customers can drive on our operation any day of the year and see what we're doing. And they do. We get a lot of people coming. Now, not so many customers as other farmers, but just them knowing that we're giving them that access means a lot to them. Because we will show them anything and everything they want to look at, you know? except for the farm books. I'm not going to show them our profitability, but they might dicker with price too much with me then. But if they, you know, they want to see where the chickens are housed, don't be afraid to show them everything, because if you do, you're going to build trust. And marketing is about convenience and trust, the two major things in marketing. If they trust you, they will buy, plain and simple. And more often than not, they'll be willing to pay for it. So I showed you our cash flow statement. I realize this is kind of hard to read, so I'll point it out. Cash crops, we grow vegetables and grain. Cover crops, we feed the cover crops to, to pork, poultry, bees, sheep. And then our cow-calf operation, we also do grass-finished beef. We have the perennials. We could market wildlife if we wanted to. We choose not to. And we have our fruit and nut orchards. We also run... Uh, uh, we've got dogs, we've got laying hens, broilers, 
The grain can be subdivided into screenings or cash grain. And I'm going to now talk about all these different enterprises and how we handle them in our operation. Every enterprise on our operation must have the ability to add value. Maybe not necessarily profit, but value. You know, there's some things we do simply because we want to advance soil health, for instance, or maybe for water quality or something like that. It may not add monetary value, but it adds some type of value to our operation. Make no mistake about it, though, most of them are profit-driven. So I mentioned the cash crops and, and all the, the different ones that we have. We've re started down this road of, of uh, orchards. Now, obviously, North Dakota was a prairie, not known for a lot of trees. However, there are a large number of native fruit trees that we can grow in North Dakota. But we're growing a lot of those, plus things like peaches and pears, which you'd never think could be grown in North Dakota. Do you know what I can get for a North Dakota grown peach? Two to three dollars per peach, okay? Because there's just nobody else doing it. So it's a novelty and they'll buy. Now, it's been a process and we're not into production. We've started getting apples now. Apples are in production, a uh, few peaches and pears. But to get the varieties that are winter hardy, you know, that's been a challenge and, and a learning curve. But we're getting there on all of them. But the things we can do with them is tremendous. You know, we want to make, uh, sell them fresh. We want to get into the ciders and the hard ciders, jellies, jams, pies. You add value every step of the way. Every step you add, you can collect more money from. So we're willing to do that with these. We started producing some hops on a small scale. You know, we're not near the number of microbreweries you have here in North Carolina. But because of that, there is nobody producing local hops in North Dakota. We're doing that. We've also started uh, planting some grapes, and uh, we hope to be harvesting the first grapes this year. Planted the nut trees, and that's more for down the road, future generations. Some of these trees we planted, it'll be 30 years before we get our first mass crop. We have a 200-year plan for our operation. That's how far out we're thinking ahead. The city of Bismarck, North Dakota is one of the fastest growing metropolitan cities under 100,000 people in the United States. We're in city jurisdiction now. How are my, my children and grandchildren going to farm and ranch there when they're surrounded by houses? The way to do that is going to be in a more pastoral type setting. So we're preparing for that already. Why not start now? Now, I often get asked from people, well, man, you could just cash out. What the heck would I want to, you know, you know, I love to hunt and fish, but I can only do so much of that. And I'm not going to put it in traveler's checks and take it with me after I die, you know. So what, what, why would I want to sell out and then where would I move to, you know. It's way too hot down here for me, so I'm not moving down here, okay. I showed those pictures before. Now, the bees, and I talked about having the, uh, and Russell did too, about how we have the pollinator habitat for the bees. We don't have bees ourselves. North Dakota is the number one honey producing state in the nation. But dur during the winter, the bees all go to either to the almond orchards in California or the citrus orchards in Florida. So what we do is we formed an agreement with an apiary, local apiary. They bring the hives to our place. And then what they do in return is they will extract that honey out of the hives that are on our place and we're able to buy it back from them. It's a good deal for them. This last year, they averaged 19% higher production on the hives that were on our land compared to their other hives. So they said, as many as you want, we'll bring you. What we do then is they'll bottle it for us. We put our label on it, and we'll sell it. We were able to buy it back from them for $1.80 a pound bottled, and we have a net profit of $2.75 per pound is our average net profit this past year on our honey. We're marketing it for $5.50 we average. We got different size containers and depending on who's, you know, how many pounds they're buying will determine the price. But think of it. We're getting increased pollination on our cash crops. Plus we're making money. We're already at the markets. We're already direct marketing things. Why not sell them honey, right? Now we got a local brewery that's starting to use our honey in one of their brews. So that's a good thing too. I like sampling that stuff, but it's beside the point. I talked about diversity in the cash crops. Now, 
I know this is different, uh, you know, we're not in the same environment, but just to drive home the importance of soil health. On the right here, this is the county averages and yields for these major crops. This is our proven yield from 2008 through 2016, which is the nine years since we quit using synthetics. So my corn production is 30% higher than county average. Wheat production is about 40%. Oat production, I can grow tremendous oats. We're 100% plus the county average. And barley is about 30% uh, higher than county average. So we can grow more than the average producer. We're not the highest yields in the county, but I guarantee you we're some of the most profitable. This is our average cost of production, including land costs, for these major crops, okay? I get really tired about people talking about yields. I wanna talk about profit. They will, they will out yield me, but I'll out profit them every time. And that means I'm gonna stay on the farm a lot longer than they are. You know, I'll never forget a number of years ago, we had one of the champion corn producers from the United States come and put on a seminar in Bismarck. And at that time, corn was selling for about $4 a bushel. So I stood up and I asked him, what is this costing you to produce a bushel? Because he was at 480 bushel or something. I don't remember the exact figure. And he said, well, I'm just about $7 a bushel. Well, I got up and walked out. I have no desire to learn how to lose money. It makes no sense, you know? So unless you're doing it profitably, it doesn't make sense, you know? So I'll just show you a couple crops, and I'm going to go through this pretty, pretty fast. I mentioned this morning how winter triticale and hairy vetch is one of our slam dunk no-brainers. The hairy vetch I'm seeding now originated that seed from the first seed I, I seeded back in 1994, 95. So we more or less have our own variety. It's never ever winter killed and it just works no matter what. Year in and year out, that's my most profitable cash crop. Over the last nine, nine years, we've averaged a net profit of $915 per acre, yes. How do you produce the seed, the, the hairy vetch seed? Do you have monocrop? No, it's, it's always grown together in a polyculture. Yep, yep. You can uh, separate it if, if you want. We tend to sell it as the mixes, and I'll talk about that. But here's all my costs, and this is from nine years. So there was a herbicide cost a few years in it. Like Russell, I don't use, I'm never going to say never. You know, Gables never stand here and say, I won't till, you know, but I haven't tilled in 23 years, you know. I'm not going to say I, I, I won't use post-emergent herbicide, but we haven't had to in many years. You know, it'll be a pre-emergent, and we don't use glyphosate either. So this even includes the cleaning cost because we're selling a lot of it for seed, and then a marketing cost because when you sell it as seed, it takes labor to do that. So I've got that in there, but that's a very profitable crop for us. And people ask me, well, why don't you sell, grow more of that? But you see, the whole system had crashed then. I need just a certain percentage of my acres in this every year because we want to be diversified, you know, so we have many different revenue streams. And if I start growing all this combination, then the other things should start showing up, you know, disease pressure, pest pressure, etc. Okay? Here's oats, really profitable for us also, $481 over the last nine years per acre. We can grow tremendous oats, and I'm marketing a lot of that as seed. We also do, I am including some grazing income in there too, because we'll always be growing the oats with clovers or that underneath it, so we get quite a bit of uh, fall grazing off of it. We've found a real market for non-GMO grains, whether it be as seed or as feed. You know, we have a lot of uh, smaller producers around us. They want to go somewhere and purchase feed for their chickens, horses, etc. I can add value to ours and sell it to them. I'm willing to sell them smaller quantities. Now, they're going to pay for it. I, I charge extra, but at least they know then they're getting the non-GMO grain they want. Now, seed sales. You talk about a low-budget a low, uh, seed mixer. This is the same grinder mixer we use as feed for the hogs. All we're doing is running it through the, the mineral compartment there. We'll mix up any uh, seed mix a producer wants according to their resource concerns. We'll put it in totes and we charge them for it. 
We get in cover crop seed in large quantities because North Dakota is a long way from anywhere. So I might as well buy a whole semi-load. I need some myself. We're going to produce as many different varieties as we can ourselves. But a lot of the species we're just not able to produce seed in North Dakota for. So because of that, I'll buy it and bring it in, use what I need myself, market the rest to other producers. It's a pretty decent income for us year in and year out. Now, when we're... Uh, after we combine our crops that we're going to sell from seed, we'll run them through this quick cleaner. This just cleans out any broken kernels, any weed seeds, etc. Then that goes to generate more profit. The way to generate large profit is by taking the waste stream from one enterprise to fuel the profit in another. So that grain screenings that you know the elevator would dock you for. We're going to feed that to our land hens, to our broilers, and to our hogs. Otherwise, it's just waste. Why not add value to it? What do I care that it takes our broilers another two weeks to reach kill weight? It doesn't matter because the feed's not costing me hardly anything, right? So time value of money right now with interest rates as low as they are is really very minimal. So why not add value that way? Okay? So that's what we do. That's where we use the grain screenings. Now, we run about 300 approximately cow-calf pairs. That number is pretty uh, stable year in and year out. We keep it at that number because our one grazing unit, that's about how many it'll handle. And the purpose of a cow on our operation is to utilize low-quality feedstuffs and to produce a live calf. That's her total job. We do no vaccinations, no porons, no wormers, like I said, any of that. It's just a low, low input operation. That's native prairie in North Dakota. That's one of our, one of a picture off ours. So we'll run 300 cow-calf pairs. We also do quite a bit of custom grazing. We will bring on producers' uh, cattle. Now, we're a bit picky who we custom graze for because I don't want you, them using any wormers or that also because I just don't want to bring those insecticides onto our operation. We're fortunate we have several producers that they just need the pasture and they're happy to have it. So I can call them up and say, hey, I got 60 days worth of grazing for 100 head. And they'll bring the livestock because they're just happy to have it. We do all the management, though. I don't allow anybody else to manage my resources like that because I want to make the final decision when these livestock get moved, etc. But that's the variable. If we get into a drier year, don't quite have enough forage, I just don't call them. So be it, you know, and, and they're good with that, you know, works out real well. Now, if we wanted to, there's a pretty nice buck standing right there. If we wanted to, we could sell hunting rights on our land. I can't tell you how much more wildlife we have now that we've gone down this path. But I'll give you one example. Here, about six years ago or so, we had a really tough winter where it was like 120 inches of snow. So it was tougher than the 90 plus we had this year. But we had deer just start coming to our place because of the cover crops. They were going through the snow to get the covers. I got a picture hanging in my office downstairs that the North Dakota Game and Fish Department sent me. They flew over in an airplane and they got a picture on one quarter, 160 acres, 876 deer. That's a lot of deer. They caused some damage for me that year, you know. But yeah, there's a lot of people willing to pay big bucks to come and hunt on our land. What we choose to do instead, there's an outfit called Sporting Chance, which is for paraplegics, wounded warriors. It allows them the opportunity to come and, and hunt. We've set up several huts on our place. You know, they're, they're ground blind, so we can, they're wheelchair accessible and that, and that's who we allow to hunt. My son and I also have a list of young people who are maybe their parents don't hunt or or single parent households, whatever the case may be, we take as many of them as we can each year and get them their first deer. Because to, to arrow or shoot a deer on our operation, it's just, you know, there, there's so many, it's, it's not, uh, not hard to do, but it's really exciting to get them their first animal. So, but that is an option. I'm just showing you different options you can have. Now, like I said, we grass finish our beef. So what I'm going to do here is very quickly run you through the cost of production for us to grass finish a beef animal. So this is the life cycle of a beef animal. 
I've got cow depreciation figured in there at $300 because you've got to account for the cost of the cow. So this is days. We leave the calves on the cow approximately 300 days. Our average cost to do that's about $1.48 per head per day. That might seem high, but everything's included in there. Labor, fencing, water, mineral, everything, okay? Then we wean the calf. Then they graze native, native pastures. Then they graze cover crops. Then when they're coming uh, 18 to 20 months old plus, they'll go to bale grazing because at that time, those animals are weighing probably 800, 900 pounds plus, we need to, you know, it's dead of winter, we got to bale graze, that's the most expensive per day cost we have then. And then we'll finish them and we'll finish them on grass on a variety of different mixes. We kill all the time and I'll explain more of that coming up. So they may be anywhere from 24 to 32 months of age. So they might get finished on triticale vetch, they might get finished on cool season perennial pastures, you know, alfalfa, brome, etc. They might get finished on the warm season covers. It'll vary. But this past year, it cost us an average of $1,231 to take a beef animal from birth to slaughter. There's, a, there's not many feedlots that can compare to that, you know, especially when you compare cow costs in there, kill costs. That's what our grass finished beef looks like. That's a couple ribeye steaks right there, you know. Then, what happens then, from last year, the retail end, so the Browns Marketing LLC, averaged $3,452 per beef animal. There are some cows included in there, because we'll market our cow cows as burger through this also. So then you take off the marketing, processing, transportation. Obviously, there's kill costs and there's marketing costs. The live animal cost of 2000 that's the amount we agreed upon last year that the marketing paid the ranch. So the ranch got paid $2,000 for every animal. The marketing business then made a net profit of $856 per animal. Now the ranch, it made $2,000 minus the $1,231 I showed you before. The ranch made $769, so total net profit per animal was $1,625 between the two entities. That's pretty good, you know? That's pretty good. Okay. Another thing we're just starting to get into is to market the hides. Because we run some of these British whites, to me, the outside color of an animal, I could care less. It doesn't matter as long as the meat's red. So, but a lot of people really like these speckled hides. Well, we'll add value, and we're just moving down that path right now, starting to do some uh, tanning and that of the hides. Now, our grass-finished lamb business. I tell everyone our, our sheep are on a planned grazing system. Wherever they plan on going, that's where they are, you know. <laughs> but no, it doesn't work out too bad. We have 165 ewes right now we're running. We could run many more. We could have a flock easily of 3,000. The land base would, would uh, handle it. But our marketing, we're not in a lamb eating area of the country. We're letting the, uh, our customers learn about lamb. And so as their appetites expand, so will our, the number of, of sheep we have on our place. So here's just, uh, this is just a picture of uh, some, we leave the males intact, most of them. And so the weathers and rams are out here grazing cover crops. Um, here they, they graze 43 days, 108 animal days per acre. We're keeping them in with a three wire polywire fence. As long as you keep moving them, and they're not being moved every day, we give them plenty, they're being moved every, every few days, it works pretty good. We're finishing them at about one year of age, weighing 133 pounds, strictly on forage. And we're not pushing them, yes? What breed is this? Yeah, these are Katahdin Dorper Cross. We choose to go that simply because we don't want a monkey with shearing them. So it's working out real well. Our sheep also, they get absolutely no wormers, no vaccines, nothing. And they've called themselves now where we just never have a problem with, uh, with any parasite load or anything on them. Predators? Yes. Yeah, predators, we do run guard dogs, and I'll talk about that with the sheep. We found out the hard way the first year on that. So, and we use them to utilize areas that we're not able to utilize with the beef cattle. 
Obviously, there's, there's fruit trees and nut trees in each one of these tree tubes. You put cows in there, they're just going to snap them off. The sheep don't bother them at all. So it's a good way to add value to those areas. Good way to stack enterprises. There's some that are ready to be harvested. So I'm not going to go through this line by line, but last year it cost us about $118 to finish a lamb. The re average retail was $775. $200 is what the uh, ranch charged the marketing. So the net profit was $446 from the marketing standpoint per lamb. The retail made, eight, uh, the ranch made $82. So net profit per lamb was $528, but we averaged 1.6 lambs per ewe, so it was $884 per ewe. So that's more profitable than cattle per dollar invested, hands down. Now, because we run sheep, we need to have guard dogs. So we have a Pyrenees male and two Akbosh Marimer females. Because I like working with things smarter than me, I use border collies. We don't need them to work the cattle because the cattle will just come on their own. But last year we made 14,000 selling pups. They're not registered. We just sell them as non-vaccinated pups right at weaning. 500 bucks pop. And the market, it's amazing, the market for these. We've got them anyway. Why not have a male and female? It's all gravy, you know, right? It, it's just, why not add value that way? And we've gotten a pretty good reputation for selling border collies. Yes? Uh, you mentioned you don't uh, worm your animals. No. You've never had a problem with it? If it was a problem, they only die once. <laughs> you know, really we don't. Now, obviously, if an animal of ours gets ill, we're going to treat him. We're going to do the humane thing and treat him. But we don't keep them. They go. I can only think of, of one hog and one lamb that we noticed worms on, and so we treated them and got rid of them. That's in all the years. But realize what we're doing. The environment they're in is healthy. I'm sure that, that if they tested them, there'd be some parasite load on them. But they're healthy. You know, we just don't get sick animals. I'm not saying never, but rarely, you know. Now, right away, we went through a lot of animals, you know, that, that early on that just came up open whatever. And it may have been due to parasites is why they didn't rebreed. But then you get rid of them. Pretty soon your problem's gone. Yep. Okay. Pastured pork. Russell talked about this. This is, uh, you know... Fairly new to us. We've only been in it about four years now. We run Berkshire, Tamworth Cross, a couple heritage breeds. But we had to put in there, we added Gloucester, or sometimes they call them old spots, for fertility now the last year. And that's really increased the, uh, the number of uh, live pigs weaned per sow. They're always outdoors too. I mean, even in the winter at 60 below, we just jump a straw bale out there and they're out there. We don't confine any of our animals except the laying hens. We use the pigs to enhance diversity. This is an old shelter belt around the farmstead. It was getting a lot of overgrowth, so we run the feeder pigs through there. Now, we farrow sows. We have about 25 sows we farrow. And then once those piglets are weaned, then they move down to my place and we use them wherever we want. Uh, this past year we used them starting out in that shelter belt and what we did, we went in there before and broadcast some cover crops, let the pigs root through it all. That's 46 days later. It worked pretty good. Just stimulating some diversity in there. The thing we really noticed, it really opened up the canopy in that old shelter belt too and we're getting a lot of uh, seedlings coming in there. In other words, you're harvesting all levels of energy, you know. More sunlight you can get in there, the better. Here we're, we're uh, finishing them on some covers out there. And I think I have a photo coming up. We figure they're getting approximately a third of their uh, ration from the forage. Two-thirds from the screenings we're supplementing them with. You got to move often, just like Russell said. Otherwise, they are going to root things up. This is our portable water. That's just an old... Uh, an old uh, trailer there. We put a couple of those shuttles on, a little bit of shade for when we're not near a farmstead. And we, our, all of our pastures, we have 
shallow pipelines plumb through them. So we can just hook a hose up and get water wherever we're at and fill those shuttles and it works really good. So cost of the pigs. It costs us about $150 including the sow cost to take a piglet from birth to slaughter. That's what it looks like when we're selling it. Yeah, that looks pretty good, doesn't it? Okay. Average income, including the sows last year, gross income retail was $1,051. Take off the marketing, the $275 is what the marketing paid the ranch. Net profit per pig, $517. Now, we average seven live pigs per sow per farrowing. That is the most profitable enterprise on our ranch per dollar invested, bar none. There's nothing else that comes close to that. I mean, look at that. Why would I run, want to run beef cows, really, right? Well, because beef cows can't, I mean, because pigs can't utilize the roughage that the beef cows can. But that is a profitable enterprise right there. Yes? Are you feeding anything else besides your grain screens? Towards the end there, we're supplementing a little bit of peas and a little bit of corn in with it. But we grow it ourselves. There's no mineral or anything else. Though no, you know, they talk about hogs need all these balanced amino acids. I don't know, they look pretty healthy to me. They're profitable. There is no doubt, and Rocco and I had this conversation on the drive over here this morning, there's no doubt if we would balance all our rations and supplement, we probably would generate some more dollars. But really, I don't care. This is, I can live with this, you know? So I just don't want to go through all that work, you know, of, of doing all that. And why? It's profitable the way it is. And we're able to do it with what we produce on our operation. Yes? Do you market your hogs as soy-free or not? As soy-free? We've never used that label. I could because we don't use any soy. Peas are, pea screenings are the primary uh, protein supplement in there. I haven't had to use that at all. Russell? A lot of producers in North Carolina just leave animals on pasture, really graze down fescue, and they're having to throw 20, 25 gallons of water per head a day. Did you see a, a, a water need reduction when you started grazing your animals because they're, they're getting some of that from the, from the higher vegetation? Yes, realize though, I, I honestly can't say that because I don't have anything to measure it against. Because yeah. ours have always been out doing it. That's all we've known. So it only makes sense that there would be. You know, we'll really notice uh, as temperature cools off these hogs, they hardly drink water, you know in our environment if they're grazing a lush, lush forage in that. So I can't honestly say it because I've never measured. Pardon me? They'll be on pasture, you still don't have to throw a lot of water. Oh no, not at all. Yep, not at all. Question over here there was? Did, did I miss here or did earlier you say you were thinking about backing off of pigs or stopping? Did you say that? No, I didn't say that. Oh, oh he's on the crop plant or something. That's oh, yeah, we're not going to... I had a picture in there where they're grazing on cover crops on the cropland. We're not going to run them on as much of this as we are on our perennial forages. And now, as long as you brought that up, that's a good point. I mentioned this year how we're having to bale graze. In other words, we set our bales out there, just give cattle access to a week's worth of bales at a time, and they just free eat off them. That's where our hogs are going to be go this year because you'll have a lot of organic material there left from the bale that the cattle didn't eat. Because we were getting a foot of snow a week there for five weeks in a row. So there was some hay covered up in that. Well, the hogs will rut through that and eat what they want and disperse it. That's a perfect place for them to go. Yes? Uh, how do you farrow your hogs? How do we farrow them? They farrow on their own. That's the one thing that's been a real challenge for us. We're not penning them individually. And there's some cannibalism going on a bit in that. So... I think I would have been better off going to Texas getting some feral hogs and, you know, they could take care of their young. The toughest thing for us has been to take these animals that are so used to being in confinement and in a pampered situation and expect them to revert back to their natural instincts. It takes a while. The hogs have been the slowest to do so uh, from a mothering standpoint. Now that we injected the old spot, uh, Gloucester in there, they're much better at it as compared to the Tamworth and Berkshires. So you don't do any winter farrowing? No, we don't. Yeah, they be, they're pig sickles in the winter. If you, that doesn't work to farrow in the winter in North Dakota. 
When you say you're marketing direct, does that mean <laughs> farmer's markets or grocery stores? I'll get into that coming up. The direct marketing I'll get into. Okay, land hands. This is also a very, very profitable enterprise for us. Right now we're running a thousand hens on pasture. We, we buy these old trailers like this and all we do is paint them up. This right here, that is a, uh, a photosensitive eye. So in the morning when the sun comes up, it raises this door, at night it closes it. So we don't have to go out there morning and night and open it up for the hens. In front here, this is just an old auger axle. Uh, my son goes around to all the farmstead, buys all the old grain augers, and he makes these dollies. So this is a hitch that drops down over a ball on our, on our quad, and we can pull these around to follow the fat cattle. Here's what the inside looks like. We just gut them out. We put mesh on the floor, roosts on the side. There's a 55-gallon tank up front with the uh, gravity-fed water. Hang the nest box on the back door. We can put about 150 hens in each one of these. And this is where they spend their summer then, out on pasture, and we'll just pull them around. They'll follow the fat cattle by about three days. So our grass finishers will come through a pasture. We'll move the land hens behind. We've got seven of these. Like I said, about a thousand layers right now. We sell our eggs. This just shows a week worth. We don't shoot for maximum production. You know, in a, in a hen house in confinement, they're shooting for 90% plus efficiency. We're very satisfied with about 60%. So our 1,000 hens are giving us about 600 eggs per day. So during the summer at peak production, we're making about $1,375 profit per week. We sell our eggs for $5 a dozen. You know, you can buy eggs for what, a buck a dozen grocery store? We can't even begin to keep up. There is a difference. National Geographic was out filming at our place two years ago. They said, is there really a difference? So I said, you go buy whatever egg you want in the store when you go to town tonight. And they come out the next day, I let them pick whatever eggs they wanted out of the egg mobile. Well, yeah, there's a difference. You know, and that just blew their mind. But there is. And people say, man, five bucks a dozen. I could easily be running 5,000 hens, and we couldn't even begin to keep up with demand right now. And there's a lot of people selling eggs, but quality sells. It does. Now, we do things a little differently in that we don't uh, provide artificial light and push our hens to produce in the winter. So this is a hoop house we have. We use it for a little bit of vegetable production, spring and fall. But then in the winter, that's where we house our hens. And we put them in the hoop house. They're in there for about three and a half months. You know, this winter it's going to be a little longer than that. But we don't provide artificial light. We're still getting eggs, but it's really making our customers crave our eggs come summer because we don't, we can't produce enough. You know, we're getting 250, 300 eggs a day, you know, depending on what time of year it is. But very, very profitable for us. If, my, if I had younger children, our grandkids, if my son would ever get busy, you know, then, then that would be their operation. Because I tell you what, a couple thousand layers, that's pretty good income for somebody. And we are going to 2,000 layers this summer. Yes? You also supplement with feed? The, the hens get screenings. The only thing we buy for them is oyster shells. Because with the amount of residue we have on our operation, for them to get grit is kind of hard to do. So we do supplement oyster shells. But that's the only supplement they get, you know. Once in a while, we'll throw some roadkill in there, too, for in the winter. They kind of like that, but, you know. Okay, pastured broilers, I'm not going to talk a lot about that, except in North Dakota, we're limited by law. There is no poultry processing facility in North or South Dakota. We can process up to 999 head on our farm, but the people have to come to our farm to pick them up. So we're limited how many we can have. It's fairly profitable for us. Our net profit last year was $12.25 per bird. But it's very labor intensive, so we don't we don't do as much of it as we were as we once did. Question. What did you sell your birds for per pound? Bir wow. Birds four per pound. A four pound bird we were getting twenty two dollars if we include the gizzard and feet. Five dollars a pound is what we're getting. Five a pound. Okay, another question. Yeah, with, with all your uh, enterprises, how many people do you employ? Yeah, it's me, myself, and I. No, <laughs> it's me, my wife, and our son. Okay, there's three of us. Now, we do have a few interns during the summer. Interns are God's way of teaching Gabe patience. 
That's what interns are. <laughs> Last year we had four interns. We decided we'd go. Usually we just have two. We decided to go to four. They were all female. Only one had ever been on a farm. We get a lot of applicants. Uh, last year we had 89 applicants from all over the world. We select based on the person, totally on the person. And if we think they are really going to uh, further the regenerative ag movement. Like one of the interns we had last year, I, I was speaking in California in January and uh, had this young lady come up to me afterwards and she said, I want to apply for one of your internships. And I said, okay, the deadline's in three days, but I'll email you an application. I get her application. She's got a master's in nursing. She's in charge of hiring all the nurses and dietitians for four clinics. And I'm like, of course I had to interview her. We do Skype interviews. And I said, okay, Ruth, come on. You're obviously making really good money doing what you're doing. Why would you quit that and come work for $200 a week? She said, if I'm going to really teach my patients about human health, I first under, have to understand soil health. I had to hire her. I mean, you just have to with that kind of passion. And she's be, she was one of the better interns we've ever had. You know, just tremendous. And, and so we hire based on that. But in saying that, when they don't know how to drive a tractor, let alone front end of a cow and back end, I mean... We spend more time just babysitting and educating than you get work out of them. So, but that's all it is, is the three of us. So moving on here, carbon. I mentioned how all farm profitability is tied to carbon. So I got looking at what do we have on our operation that I can add more carbon besides growing plants? Well, you see here in the background, there's some old field windbreaks. Uh, my father-in-law back in the 60s had planted some of these field windbreaks because he was summer fallowing and wind erosion. Well, some of those are starting to die out. Now, all my neighbors will push them in piles and burn them. No, I'll bring them all to our place. We'll rent a wood chipper and then we'll chip them. Then what I'm doing is I'm propagating fungi with them. So we'll take and we'll inoculate that with fungi spores, and there's places you can get that. And then what we're doing is we're putting them around our new... Uh, fruit and nut plantings. And it's amazing the difference it's made on those trees from a survivability standpoint. And it, you know, it's a way to add more carbon to the soil. The other thing we're doing is we make our own compost. And what I do there is everything that can be composted goes in that pile. And it's a two year process. The first year it goes in that windrow and it's, you know, I told you I was in the bull business for 26 years. So everybody and their brother sends me their bull sale catalog. Well, they're all right here in that compost pile, you know, because we raise our own bulls. I'm not going to buy any, you know. So everything goes in there, you know. And then what we do is the first year we turn this pile just with the front end loader several times. The second year, like I told you this morning, I will take a few five-gallon buckets full of soil from my native prairie and spread it out in there. Then we put it in a round circle because moisture is limiting in our environment with kind of a concave in the middle. So it collects water and it just sits for a year. Then after, oh, we've also got people now who want to buy compost from us. So we've started to sell a little bit. But what we do with that compost then is we spread it on areas we're going to do our vegetable production. So our large scale grain fields do not get any compost because we can only generate so much. We don't have the material. And that's what the soil looks like after we've spread the compost on it. So this past year, we just did five acres of heirloom vegetables, and I showed you that a little bit this morning, how we plant the sweet corn, and, and then peas and beans, and there will be squash, zucchini, watermelon, pumpkins, everything will, will be in this field just in rows for, for ease of harvesting, you know. And we'll tend to obviously plant like pumpkins or zucchini that are going to spread. We'll be near peas and radish and that, so those early crops are all harvested, and then the pumpkins spread zucchini, etc. It tends to work out pretty good. Are you familiar with hugel culture, anyone? Okay, so here's how we do North Dakota hugel culture style. We just do everything with a loader tractor, and this is one I just built this past fall. We just take the whole trees, branches, dump them all in there, logs. Then we take, this is a mixture of, I think I got another picture, Oh, here's more branches in that. I make a mixture up of compost mixed with some soil. 
And then we put that on. Here we are mixing all that up. And I mix those wood chips in there. And I've inoculated some of those wood chips with that fungi spawn. Dump it all on there. And that's kind of what we end up with. There's a finished hugel culture. And we have three of these now. That's approximately uh, 200 to 300 feet long by about 12 feet wide. And that's where a lot of our perennial production will be. Yes? With the wood chips you mentioned earlier and with the hugel culture, uh, how much pine can you use? Can you we use quite a bit because we have quite a few of those old shelter belts are pine. So we're using quite a bit. They say it's not ideal, but I don't know. Our, our vegetables don't taste like pine nuts, so yeah. Yeah. Now, one of the other things we're also just starting to get into is some mushroom production. And uh, we're starting to do that with some of the logs. We're just in the infancy stages of that. But it's all about diversity. So on these hugo cultures, we'll... Some of them are dedicated towards our perennials, you know, the asparagus, garlic, everything. And then some are dedicated uh, just for the transplants, peppers, tomatoes, etc. And then we also put flowering species. We always have flowers, no matter what we're doing. And that really works out well to attract the pollinator insects. But then what we're also doing with it, we let the interns make bouquets and we'll sell them at the farmer's markets too because they can't make enough bouquets to sell all the flowers on the place. So, but it's how do you add value? We always got to think about how you add in value. You're at the farmer's market anyway, so what if we sell $100, $150 worth of bouquets in a Saturday? I mean, that's extra money. Why wouldn't you want to do it, right? Work on developing your own markets to capture more of the food dollar. One of the sayings my son and I have is, if not me, who, if not now, when? When we wanted to transition into direct marketing, the biggest issue we had is there was only three slaughter facilities in North Dakota that were inspected where you could retail from it. The waiting list was 13 months. You can't run a business that way. So a group of us got together, and after about four years and $2.2 million, we built Bowdoin Meat Processors. This is a for-profit, separate entity the, we hired seven full-time employees now. It's harvesting bison, beef, lamb, and pork. That's what that facility can harvest. So we run our pork and lamb and some of our beef through that facility. We're the po to the point now with our direct marketing that this plant was not able to fabricate to our satisfaction the cuts. So now we're actually shipping semi-loads of beef cattle down to Omaha, they're being harvested there, then it's being shipped to U.S. Wellness Meats in Missouri, being fabricated there, because they'll guarantee us all the cuts are fabricated within half of an ounce, which allows us a lot more marketing opportunity. Plus, we're able to get the hot dogs processed, which our plant cannot do. We're doing beef bacon, we're doing all these tallow, all these specialty things that we couldn't do at our plant yet. So we're doing that now, yes. Are you marketing most of these uh, products within North Dakota? Or you... It all has to be within North Dakota because our plant is only state inspected. Everything's being marketed within the state. Now, the beef, we, we do now have the ability to, it's USDA inspected. We could market nationwide, but I really believe in selling local, so that's what we're focused on. In our mind, North Dakota is local. There's only 650,000 people, as I said. So everything gets our label on it, and that's how we market it. Here's how we market now. This is what we did this past year in our enterprise sales as far as the livestock are concerned. About half is beef, 20% pork, eight lamb, six eggs, three honey, 1% flour, 11% vegetables. That's a rough breakdown of our marketing this past year. All I'm trying to show you here is look at the diversity we have there. All my eggs aren't in one basket, you know what I mean? So it, it, we're going to the market, we might as well sell them many things. Here's how we're selling it. About 24% is at farmer's market, 6% is at expos or shows, 51% is online orders. That's the majority of it, and it's expanding rapidly. And then only 19% is wholesale retail. We do have a large number of restaurants that want to buy our product. We've stayed away from that because they want specific cuts. 
We need to market the whole animal. And so we can better control that if we don't get into that market. Here's how we're doing the online sales. You go to our website, nourishbynature.us, you sign up, you shop, and then we have pickup points. Uh, this just shows the shopping, what you can buy there. And we sell in individual cuts. So we'll sell you a whole animal, half animal at a significant discount. But the majority of people are just buying cuts. And that's where the money lies. Because the more refined we get, the more money we can make. We have six drop points. This is North Dakota here. I'm right here by Bismarck. So we have six drop points. When you go online and order, it'll say a time and date that we're going to be in that town. You've got a half hour window to pick up your product. You've ordered online. You've already paid with a credit card online. If you're not there, it's not a, <laughs> so we got your money, you know. People will be there. And it's working really, really well for us, you know. We can service, we can go to one of these towns and service 25 to 50 customers in 30 minutes, you know, once we're there. Uh, obviously, there's some labor involved, but, but you get well, well paid for it. <laughs> customers order and pay online, talked about that. We do, are starting to attend several different farmers markets around the state just once a month to get our name out. Yes? Oh, but you said that your beef is what can be cut, they'll guarantee you the half pounds. Yep. One of the things that we ponder a lot is we don't have anywhere near that, and, and so your pork is not that precise, right? So your yep. pork chops. So yep. how are you getting people to pay online? Yeah. Oh, no, I can tell you exactly, and I know where you're going with the question. The reason we're not, we don't have enough pork or lamb to ship it to a facility that'll guarantee us that. So what, what has to be done now when the products are ordered online, the cutoff time is 48 hours before pickup. Because we have to box your product, we know the weights, because the weights are put on at the kill plant, but then we gotta, we gotta email you back, here's your invoice total, then you gotta swipe your card. See, by going to the, the cut within a half an ounce, we can just eliminate that for all the beef products. Now we're selling you a package, this is what it costs. But the pork, but the pork and lamb, we can't. Yep. Chicken, has to be on farm. chicken has to be on farm. Yep, we, we're not allowed by law to take chicken. Now eggs, we are certified, uh, we're, we're certified to sell our eggs anywhere because we have an on-farm cleaner in that to clean the eggs. Yep, other questions? Okay, now one of the things we were instrumental in is this is a food co-op. It's an 8,000 square foot facility that uh, uh, my wife and I were the largest contributors to because we wanted a place in Bismarck, Mandan where people could buy healthy food. So we do sell some of our, our uh, meat products there and the honey there. In saying that, um, We've had a real tough time educating management as the importance of the difference between grass-finished beef, grain-finished. It's, it's been a real learning process to get them to understand that. We do utilize what's called graze cart software developed by the Hits Fields uh, in our direct marketing. My son uses surveys like SurveyMonkey and he uses MailChimp, Google Analytics, and all these things that I do not understand. I just turn it over to him, it's his business. But it's really interesting, he can keep track of the number of hits of, and everything he's getting, where they're coming from, how long people are spending looking at our website and all that. And you use these things to further your sales. And it's amazing what he's able to find out there. I have no idea about it, I don't care about it, I turn it over to him, let him run with it. I know that most producers my age aren't going to give a rat's butt about it, but you know, find a young person, there's a lot of young people in this who I know will eat this stuff up and they understand it. Just match up with one of them and let them take it and run, you know? He also does send out a newsletter every couple weeks or every month which he, where he tells people what's going on on the farm. This is an email newsletter. So people can open it if they want and he can tell how many opened it, how many looked at it, and he can tell them about certain specials and events we're doing on the farm. Now, another thing we did in our spare time this last spring, we built this little Arn Farm store and education center, and we built it all out of old uh, wood from our place. You know, the majority of it. There's a few things we, we couldn't fabricate ourselves, but that's all old windbreak lumber on the walls, old granary lumber on the ceiling, 
We, we have a sawmill, a person has a sawmill about five miles from us. We cut a lot of the wood from trees on our farm. And now what we do when those people come for tours or that, we, we've got a place we can house them. And we do charge for tours because it takes my time. It's, like I said, over 2,100 people less last summer. If I didn't charge it, it'd be every day. I'd just be doing nothing but tours. So we just decided, hey, my time's got to be worth something. If you, you're welcome to come look at the place, but if you want to take up my time, I'm going to charge you for my time because I, there's just not enough hours in the day to get everything done. But it adds value. If, if we have a lot of large groups come, bus loads, etc., if they want us to serve them a meal, we'll do it and charge them for it and add value that way. You know? Don't be afraid to share your experiences with others. Network and learn. That's what it's all about. And Russell will tell you how important that was when he started. Change is not an option, it's mandatory. If you're not changing, you're standing still, and if you're standing still, the microbes are going to eat you. Plain and simple. <laughs> so the sad part to my son and I and our family about this is we have a whole other list of things we want to do, but labor is our you know, weak link right now. You know? And in North Dakota, it's really tough to find labor at an affordable price. It just is. Um, the Domino's Pizza, you're familiar with that chain? Starting salary at Domino's is $18 an hour in Bismarck. That's starting salary. We had, you know, the oil boom is such there that uh, we had one of the CEOs of an oil company come on, this is a few years ago, and he said, if you've got a college, a high school education, come work for me for a year. I'll guarantee at the end of the year you'll be making over $100,000. That's the kind of salary. We, we, we just can't pay that up there. So we have to do things ourselves. Yes, I could get more interns, but let me tell you, there's only so, it's so time consuming, I can only do so many. You know, it bothers me. Like last year, I told you we had four female interns. One was from a farm. The last day of her internship, I went out to check everything like I always do at night, and she left the back doors on eggmobiles open. I'm like, come on, you've been here six months, and you, you know, you leave them open at night, and they're going to get cleaned out with predators, you know. So, so that's our weak link. There's a lot of things we'd like to do and get into enterprises. You're only limited by your imagination. I get really upset when I come and give full day workshops, and I have. Uh, uh, parents in there who say, oh, I'd like Junior to come back, but we just don't, can't generate the income. Really? It means you're not, you just don't have the ambition to do anything else. You know, don't tell me there's not opportunities for Junior to come back. And I hear a lot of people saying, oh, we're too far from a big city or that. My son and I met a father and son at a conference there in British Columbia. They market eight hours away one way. It's an eight-hour drive, one way. They, they drive there twice a month. So each of them takes a turn. They, they said, we love where we live, but our market's in Vancouver eight hours a, away, so we just drive there twice a month, you know? Location's no problem with the way the Internet is nowadays. So this is one of the things we really want to do is help others get started. This was one of our interns, Troy. I'd take a 1,000 of him if I could get him. An operation is not truly regenerative unless the next generation takes it over. Even if it's not your own children, help the next generation get started. So I tell every intern when they come, if you show me the drive and desire to get started in agriculture, I'll get you started because what I'll do is spin off one of my enterprises to you. I will finance that enterprise. We'll give you the land base to run it on. You're going to pay us a fair price but we're gonna buy the product back from you and make sure you make a profit as long as you've done your job. You know, and then once you grow to a certain point, you can go off on your own, you know? Why not help others get started? I mean, there's, we got, there's no shortage of work on our operation, so I'll gladly let some of them do it. Now, some other things we wanna do, we're seriously looking at a food truck. We don't want the food truck business as much as we want the commercial kitchen. It's very hard in North Dakota with the way the laws are to get a commercial kitchen inspected and up and running. It's very, a lot easier to get a food truck up and running. Food truck is a commercial kitchen though. So what we can do is take things like soup bones, which we get $7 a pound, and convert it to bone broth, which we can get near 20 bucks a quart for, okay? 
So you can add further value up the chain by doing that. The other thing, we've already done the feasibility study on a poultry processing facility. There will be one built in North Dakota here within the next couple years. We're trying to decide on location and management and everything else right now. My son's very involved with the local food hub that wants to aggregate product and then disseminate it out because we want local foods to be for everybody, you know, not just the larger producers. More and more consumers have, are thinking of food as preventative medicine. Take advantage of this. Enjoy signing the back of the check and not the front. It's a lot more enjoyable to sign the back of the check. You know, why not do that? I don't know why as producers we think we got to sign the front of that check. We're adding an additional 30 plus percent by direct marketing. That's significant profit. You know, yes, it's a lot more work. Now, my son will tell you, even though all these enterprises, over half of his time is spent on marketing. You know, so, but think of how we run these enterprises, and I appreciate the question, how much labor, but think of the things I don't do. No fertilizer, no pesticides, no fungicides, no vaccines, no wormers for livestock. We don't run them through chute. We're not calving. We don't pay attention to them much at all at calving time. You know, it, it's just not work what we're doing. You know, no-till, less trips across the field, you know. I do hire my combining done now. I did own a combine, but a guy pulled in the yard to buy some cover crop seed here two years ago. He offered me more for that combine than I'd paid seven years previously. Goodbye. I don't need it anymore. You can have it. My neighbor, the organic producer, leases two new ones every year. He'll come and combine for $25 an acre. Why would I want to own a combine, right? So, so you just got to do things like that, and you can make it work. We're now profitable every year regardless of price because we set our own prices. And I'm not going to do something if I can't make a profit at it, if it doesn't add value to the operation. We do this without any government pay grant, program payments. No EQIP, no CSP, no crop insurance, no other government program. I want to make it clear, I did take advantage of some of those starting out, but I've found that all they do is hinder my movement towards regenerative ag. That's one of the reasons I just will not become certified organic. You know, not that there's anything wrong with it, but I'm getting as high as organic prices. Why do I want to go through all the certification hassle, right? So do what you want. I'm not down playing organic by any means, but what I'm saying is it's all about branding, between you and trust, between you and your customer. One's ability to be successful with regenerative management is directly related to one understanding of how ecosystems function. If you understand how your farm or ranch is an ecosystem and how to use it to add value, that's when you're profitable. It's all about a healthy ecosystem. The current production model is leading us down the wrong path. It promotes monocultures, lessens diversity, hinders soil health advancement, it discourages the next generation, and it lessens the income potential of any operation. The choice is yours. That's my family there. My grandson, who I'm so proud of, he's already. I got to tell you a quick story just to finish up. Last night when I got down here, I got a text from my daughter. She said at daycare yesterday, they made, fed the kids hamburgers at noon. Well, then afterwards, they, all the kids thought they were cooking hamburgers. So my son went out and he got the, the plastic cow and put it in the pan. I thought, yes, he understands. <laughs> He's not even two, and he understands where beef comes from, so that's great, yeah. With that, I, I went through that mighty fast, but if you have questions, I'll certainly answer them and stand here, stay here as long as you want. Yes? I'm not trying to argue, it's just nope. a question. Yep. Uh, you talk about the... I love to argue, so it doesn't matter, because I'm, I'm always right, and I know it. The, uh, you're talking about the, the great interest on the part of the dentist, uh, this nurse, uh, yeah. Uh, the farm community, and yet I saw a YouTube video of, of some future farmers of America, yep. and they, their guest of honor was a guy from Monsanto, and they yep. were cheering and stamping their yep. feet and everything like, yep. you know, the latest yep. and greatest from the chemistry lab is going to solve all our problems. Yep, absolutely right. I, I, can't, I can't reconcile. Yep, yep, and here, here's what's happening. It's like a little snowball starting uphill. And it's rolling and rolling pretty soon. And this is the way I answer that question. 
If Monsanto is not worried about what's coming, why are they suddenly moving in and buying up all these biological companies? They know pretty soon they're going to have to rectify a lot of the problems that their products caused. So they're buying up all these biological companies because they, they're in business to sell something. And they want, they want to sell you something. You know, I think that's one of the reason, you know, pe speakers like me and Russell and that are so in demand is that we're not selling you anything. If you don't, you know, if you go home and don't do a thing on your farm, it's not going to make a difference to Gabe's pocketbook, you know. I'm just sharing my experiences. So think of where production agriculture is. It's like I often hear, oh, we got to get USDA to change the farm program, then more people will move down this path. It's not going to happen. The farm program is bought and paid for by big business and lobbyists. I mean, that's just the way it is. Farmers are hesitant to move down that path because of crop insurance, EQIP, CSP. Those are all become entitlements that they want to put money in their pocket. Right? You know, you, you, know, why, you know why farmers' caps are like this, right? Looking in the mailbox for the next check, right? Do you know one expense I have now that I never used to have? I got to buy my own caps. Because there's no salesman going to come up my driveway and hand me one. You know? Doesn't happen anymore. Well, my other question, kind of related to the FFA boys, yeah. uh, is uh, I got this thing from a chemistry professor in Italy, and he's talking about the impending utter failure of the entire food production system because uh, we're going to run out of oil and we won't be able to make pesticides. And uh, when when uh, farmers can't sp spray pesticides, all the organic guys will be inundated by the pests that will now have free reign. And I thought this is the stupidest thing I've ever read. Yeah. Yeah. What well, was Russell's quote? Life is hard, but it's harder if you're stupid. You know. <laughs> Yeah. Just yeah. I don't argue with stupidity. It doesn't, uh, you know, it's a waste of time. That, that makes no sense, you know, so it's not worth worrying about. Yes. Have you seen other farms start to implement the practices that you've used that work in vegetables? Have I seen other farms? Yeah. In virtually every country around the world. Yeah. I get contacted all the time from, like I'll give you an example. Last winter I was contacted by email from a guy in South Africa. Gabe, you don't know me, but there's a group of us here who have been following you for seven years on YouTube, and we want to come see the real thing now. And he sent me this, this link to what they're doing, and I'm like, my goodness. So they flew over last summer, a whole group of them. There was like 12, 13 of them, 12 or 13 of them, and it's amazing. They've been following me for years. I was just in Australia. I, I, get, I get asked to go all over the world, and... It's happening in every country, everywhere, you know, because it works. Everybody's got soil, you know. Do you spend time trying to convince people to implement these practices, or do you just let it speak for itself? I let it speak for themselves. Now, if they contact me one on one, one on one, I will try hard to answer every email. I average between 150 and 400 a day, emails and phone calls. I try real. Some of them I don't have to answer. You know, they're just thanking me or whatever, or saying I'm an idiot, whatever, you know, that's fine. But I try hard to answer everyone, and I will work with them. I, you know, I never charge for emails or phone calls, you know, but, but in saying that, I can't spend a lot of time because it's just overwhelming. Yep. But there, there's an old saying that goes, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And I find that, you know, I could ask Laura, she was a teacher for years, some students just grasp it quicker. You know, you get the Russells, who it's just like a light bulb, boom, and then it's, the, you know, the Energizer Bunny. He just does it, you know? Like, I was up in Canada uh, here about five, five years ago, it's been now, and there was a gentleman sitting up front, and he had his arms crossed, and he was just giving me the glare and stomping his feet, and I thought, boy, this is a tough one here. Anyway, I did the presentation. He come up and asked a few questions, shook his head, and left. Afterwards, I asked the... The, the lady who was in charge of inviting me there, boy, who was that guy? Oh, that was Jack. You just rocked his world. Anyway, the next year I go up there, here Jack, I found out, 
he was on his way the next day to buy a fertilizer plant. And he was going to buy this fertilizer plant because a very large operation, it was an Amish uh, community, and they were going to, they were going to uh, uh, buy this fertilizer plant to produce all the fertilizer. Instead, he held off on that. He went home. He planted 2,000 acres of covers the first year. 2,000 acres year one. Uh, Jack calls me now every month. This last year, they had 14,000 acres of cover crops. He said they, they are synthetic free now and where they're not using uh, synthetic fertilizers of any kind. Absolutely amazing. So you get people like that that just grasp it and go. And then you get other guys that just do at their own pace. And so be it. You know, whatever you feel comfortable with. Yes. Uh, you talked about having to feed hay to your, to your cattle, yeah. but do you put up hay off your land? Do we put up hay off our land? Yes, we do. The reason being those grass finishers, I need real high quality forage. It's really tough in North Dakota to buy high quality forage. So we'll put it up on our own land, but we try and feed it on our own land. We're putting it up to preserve the quality. Now, we do buy hay, and so I'm importing a bit of nutrients there. Yep. What I do, though, the hay we put up um, um, and move off-site, I rent up, since Bismarck's expanding so rapidly, I rent, if I can get a three- to five-year lease on some land, I'll seed it down to perennials, and I'll bring those nutrients onto my land, because it'll go for houses anyway. So that's what I'm doing. Yep. We realize we don't feed much hay compared to what we used to. Last year, we fed our cow herd for 42 days. This winter is going to be considerably longer than that because of the way the winter is. Yeah, but like our yearlings last year grazed pretty much the entire winter in North Dakota. Wow. Yep. Yes. Um, we have sheep, and I've been wanting to graze the sheep on the cover crop, but yep. then we're really nervous about bloat and diarrhea. Yeah. Yeah. How do you deal with that? They'll only die once. You know. <laughs> Actually, I just I spend zero time worrying. Knock on wood, but we have never ever lost an animal to bloat grazing. Never. It just doesn't happen. And I think part of it is our healthy soils. Part of it is the diversity of the diet. You know, we just don't have an issue with anything. It's like I showed pictures there of that sorghum sedan grass seven feet tall and those finishers grazing it. We graze that right through frost and I don't worry about prussic acid, nothing. We just don't have those issues. But that shows you when the ecosystem gets healthy. But even when I started doing it, we've never had an issue. Now I have friends in Canada that are doing this. They have some bloat problems up there. You know, I tell people, experiment, you know, throw an old cow out there or something, see what happens, you know. That's all you can do, yes. Okay. I, I, since there's only three of you doing this, I'm really yeah. intrigued by that. Could yep. you speak just a little bit? Because that's how, how do you manage your time? I know you're yeah. traveling, and I, I mean, we're, we're yeah. attempting to do things that are similar to this, yeah. but it's killing us. I yeah. want to know how you're doing this yeah. to make it easy. We could get a lot more done if my son wouldn't have to sleep six hours a night, you know? <laughs> yeah. Okay, my wife is in charge of all book work and everything, and she does a fantastic job with that. She helps clean eggs, the vegetables, that kind of thing. You know, she's in charge of that, uh, uh, making sure the guard dogs get some food once in a while, things like that. My son manages the cow herd because the way our farm spread out, it's about six miles one end to the other. And he's located closest to the cow herd where he lives. So every day he moves the cow herd. I take care of the grass finished beef and the yearling cattle. Uh, we also, the laying hens during the summer are down at my place. My wife and I take care of them. And then the sheep, he takes care of the ewes. And the lambs, I take care of the finishers. I do all the grain and cover cropping because he can't be around grain dust. The hay and him and I do together, you know. Now, major projects, fencing and all that, we do together. He handles the marketing end of it. Now, I'll go to market and that. If they need me to go to this farmer's market here, I'll do it. But he, he pretty much handles that. Yeah. Now, he does have a pretty steady girlfriend who used to be an intern for us, so that might... She is now going to be on the place full time, so, so that'll help out some with the marketing end of it, too. What about the pickups? Do you all do, you do the, the, the six pickup places? Yep, yep. We'll take turns, whoever. The, you know, um, that's whoever needs to go. Now, my wife likes to take the one in the town where our grandson lives, you know, and our daughter and son-in-law. So her and I usually go do that one because we want to see them, but 
But we just take turns, whoever can, can go that night, and it all depends what's going on. I'm in charge of all the tours, pretty much. Uh, you know, I realized my son was teaching during this time. Just, he was just teaching uh, one class, range management, but now he, he had to drop that. We got a little too busy for him to keep that up. But you just work on it, you know? Yeah. The other thing is, <laughs> those who know me, I, I don't sleep. You know, four hours is a major, you know, that doesn't happen often for me. You know, it's usually about three is what I sleep. So I just, yeah, I'm really 38. I just look 89 because I've been up longer than everybody else. But that's just how we are, though. I mean, and there's nothing I'd rather be doing. It's fun. It's exciting. So, you know, there's times you get a little tired, but oh, well. I still haven't had to resort to energy drinks. I've never had one of those in my life. That or coffee. Could you imagine Gabe on coffee? Whoa. That wouldn't be good. Yeah. So... Well, comments, questions, yes. You talked about um, how you, you don't plant monocultures. You always have like a clover grown underneath your barley or whatnot. Uh, do you uh, broadcast seed that? Well, yeah. Behind yeah, the question was clovers or that interceded with the, the cash crop. Um, no, we're seeding them together. The only time I don't do that is with corn. I haven't figured out corn. In our dry environment, we can't broadcast. We just don't get a good enough germination on the broadcasted seed. So what I've found I have to do with corn is I go out the day before and I seed with my drill the clovers or vetches the next day I plant the corn. Now I'm going to try it a little different this year. I'm going to try and plant the corn and then three days later plant the clover and that. I'm going to try it a little opposite this year. But you're planting those in the same row. So it doesn't matter. Just plant them. But we just go. Makes no difference. Yeah. Uh, similar to his question, um, on a smaller scale and with uh, no-till and you're just building up uh, organic matter on the surface, uh, can you uh, broadcast almost anything? Well, that's going to depend on the rainfall you get. Can you broadcast if there's a lot of residue? That's going to depend on the rainfall. Works really well if you have the moisture. In drier environments, no, not at all. But, but, you know, Russell, correct me down here. Maybe you can answer that question. In this environment, can you broadcast into that residue and get a decent stand? The only issue we have in North Carolina is winter peas because it's such a big seed. Okay. And it's, it's hit or miss. Some years it works, some years it doesn't. But literally here, getting 42 inches, you can do about anything you want. Yeah. It'll eventually get down there. Yeah, and, and that and you gotta understand that, that organic matter like Gabe said earlier, it's holding it's actually holding moisture. So you've still got moisture in that residue and, and like this yeah. fall we went eighty days in hickory without rain from September, you know, August all the way to December. I was out drilling my weed, my weed came up, my neighbors did they had to wait till December till we got rain to even drill. So I mean that moisture holding capacity really has a huge huge impact. Yeah. The, I mean, for like the, the seed actually make contact it'll go through. with the soil, it'll, it'll get through. It'll get through. The, the root, the, you know, will get through there. The seed itself will germinate up top. The seed doesn't have to make it through. You know, Russell had a really great start to his presentation. I'll say this, even though he's here, I don't want his head to explode. But when he talked about how his first year of covers wasn't very tall, I wish I would have had the foresight to take pictures of when I started I mean, I'd start and things would grow this tall and everybody, oh, that's a failure. Well, but that root and the ground would be down here, you know. Every year it got a little better. And Russell said that, you know, now it's pretty hard for Gabe to screw up now. You know, it is because the soil is so much more resilient. It's holding more moisture. The porosity is there. You know, I don't have to worry about my equipment. It just works. You know, it's pretty difficult for me to screw up to where I have a total failure, you know. So every year it's going to get a little better. It's just you got to start somewhere. If you don't start now, when, when are you going to start? You know, that's, that's all there is to it. Yes? If you have pasture that hasn't been <coughs> grazed in a number of years, some native grass, some fescue, what would you do? With it? Yep, pasture that hasn't been grazed. And I have a whole presentation, and I'm going to talk a little more about our grazing system 
uh, tomorrow morning and Sunday morning at the workshop. But what, what I do, grazing is all about time. The time the animals are on there, and most importantly, recovery time. You know, in our dry environment now, on our native pastures, they get grazed one or two days every 15 months. That's it. Where we have animals on there for one or two days, they're off for about 15 months. I need that much recovery time in my dry environment. Otherwise, we start losing species diversity. Now, down here, you might be able to graze once every 60 days or 80 days. I don't know, you know. But way too often, people graze... Um, they graze too often, and those plant roots are not getting recovered. Yep. Somebody's vehicle. Time's up, evidently. Fire alarm, something like that. So, yeah, so that's what I'd start with. With Start grazing, and if it hasn't been grazed in a long time, I'd graze it pretty hard, so to speak, but then I'd give it a long period of recovery. Because you probably have a lot of material on the surface, that you need to get that down in contact with the biology so it can cycle those nutrients through. Oh, you did. Oh, okay. Yep. Yep. But I'd let it grow then and then, yep. Yep. Start that. Yes. Have you had um, other tremendous hailstorms since you started? Have I had other tremendous hailstorms? We've had hailstorms, but nothing that severe. <laughs> nothing like it. Like I said, my father in law was there 35 years, he had hail twice in 35 years and all of a sudden I get three out of four. I tell people, see, most people are smart enough to make a change. The good Lord had to slap me four times in a row before I made a change, you know, so. Have you made a plan yeah. for hail or is it? Yeah, our hail is our cattle or our, our insurance policy. They can always glean something, our livestock, not only the cattle but the chickens and everything, can always glean something. But right now, I mean, we're, we're doing well, you know, so it isn't, uh, it isn't as critical as it used to be, you know, for us to have that. Yes. Do you have a pretty tight grazing plan? Pretty tight grazing plan. Yeah, the, the thing we know most about our grazing plan is that it will change. No, it's, we know where we started the year before. We know when the paddocks were grazed. And, and where's Jeff? Is he still in here? That right here he is. He's, do you want to tell him a little about, uh, about what you're doing with pasture map? Uh, well, I just started working with them, but um, Pasture Map is an app for your iPhone or Android desktop that allows you to kind of set paddocks and find out how much is there and estimate dry matter and how many pounds of livestock you're putting on it and calculate the ADAs and try to help you develop a grazing plan to make it easier for you to go through and manage your livestock yep. as a new product. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And so, so we're working with that and with them. So do we have a plan? Yes. It changes a lot. Yeah, it changes a lot. There's only one thing that never changes. The last week in July, Gabe and Paul are going fishing in Canada, and no matter what, those cattle are not getting moved that week of July, you know. Maybe once or so they will get the interns to move them. That's set in stone. Everything else just fluctuates. But it has to, because no two years are the same for moisture, humidity, growing conditions, so you have to be flexible. All we know is we're going to, you know, it's kind of the eye of the master. We know that we're going to move according to the resource itself. Now, we have a rough plan. We know that at the beginning of each year, but we're going to alter that plan according to conditions. Yep. It's just kind of, you know, organized chaos at our place. <laughs> Sometimes not so organized. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Laura. Yeah, Jerry Brunetti probably did more to persuade me about farm as an ecosystem. There's a really great book out there called Farm as Ecosystem by the late Jerry Brunetti. That really got me thinking. But what really got me thinking was just observing nature, you know, just observing nature and, and what, what happens uh, in a natural environment. And... Once you start learning to observe, I think producers have lost that. You know, I talk about my one neighbors, they farm 40,000 cropland acres. That's a big farm, okay? I have only once do I remember in one of the fields them getting off and looking down at the ground. 
and I think they drop something. I really do. <laughs> but they, they don't observe anymore. They pull in there with big equipment, farm it, leave. They have no idea what's going on in their soil. Yeah, they, they take soil tests religiously, but they don't know what's going on in their soil. That's why the interns and my family know, you want to tick Gabe off, take a shovel out of the ranger. Because I've got a shovel with me all the time, and I'm looking and observing what is my soil trying to tell me. You know, listening, what are the insects, the birds, what's everybody trying to tell me? And you learn to observe, and it's just amazing what you can find out, you know? It's also very enjoyable, you know? It's pretty low stress what we do now, you know? The stressful part comes with working with all the people and getting these other entities going and co-ops and all that. That's the stressful part, you know? Right now I've got a manager, two assistant managers in that grocery store that we need to get a general manager hired and we've got a manager in the meat co-op that, oh, it's stress, things like that, but that's the people part of it. The ecosystem part of it is really pretty easy. Well, I finished early. Yes? I just wanted to say that I'm going to be collecting evaluations, so as you come out the door, please hand yeah. them to me so I can collect those for OGS. Yeah. And I'll stay here as long as you like answering questions. Yes, sir? You mentioned early on about the vegetables or something you did. Fire and Sarah. And you checked that on your vegetables and other things. Everything's pretty hot. Have we checked nutrients? We carry refractometers with us to do rough checks on our pasture forages and that, and it's pretty amazing what we've seen. Now, there are times of the year where our BRICS readings are low, you know, when we're just coming in the spring, or if we have, you know, if I did something wrong in a cropping sequence and something's lacking, we'll end up with low BRICS. But, like, it's not uncommon for us to run 25 to 30 BRICS on, on some of our forages, you know, which is really high, and we can really get the gains in now, what we're trying to do as far as measure in the vegetable and meat production is do commercial analysis of those products because we want to be able to prove that what I'm saying is true. The hard part is, what do you compare it to? Because do I just walk into a grocery store and grab some other meat and do an analysis on that? But I don't know enough about that to really make a comparison, you know? So we're moving down that path, and it's, it's not cheap to do these full-blown analysis on omega-3s and CLAs and everything else, but we're moving in that. The, uh, the way to tick off all the other vendors at the farmer's market is take a refractometer and start measuring everything. They don't like that too much, you know. But, oh, well. I usually send my daughter to grab samples from everybody, yes. That's one thing I've observed here is that uh, for the most part, Things that are available for sale are very low risk. Yeah. Whether it be uh, you go out somebody's pasture check, whether it be uh, any vegetable you pick up at the farmer's market, and it doesn't matter whether it's grown organically or not, it's, they're, yeah. they're very much lacking. You don't, to find an excellent quality one is really, really difficult. Yeah. To find poor quality, you can find it everywhere. And you know, the amazing thing is, you find a high bricks vegetable. You'll taste it immediately. You will know immediately. Your body will tell you, man, this is good. Now, if you out there and observe cattle, you know, cattle have these whiskers on their chin, and what they're really doing is they're, they're, those whiskers sense for nutrients, and they can actually sense if something is more uh, nutrient-dense than another forage, and they'll graze accordingly. And when you watch them do that and then measure the bricks, it's amazing. How, how intelligent animals are. Yet us as humans, you know, look at what we eat. I mean, it's ridiculous, you know. It's amazing the, you know, we've had visitors from all 50 states, every Canadian province, and 21 foreign countries the last five years since we started keeping track. The number one comment I get from uh, people from other countries is how poor the food tastes in the United States. It's just lacking nutrients, you know. And I think it's because of our farming practices, a large part of it. Now, I'm not blaming all human health. Well, look at it this way. The United States spends more on health care than any other country in the world, yet we're the 42nd healthiest country in the world. We're first in ADD, ADHD, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, autoimmune diseases, cancer, and obesity. We're number one in all those. 
That, that's a travesty. Are farmers to blame for all that? Absolutely not. Are farmers to blame for part of it? Absolutely. And I think that's why this is coming to such a crescendo, so to speak, here pretty soon, is this health crisis we have in this country is just appalling. And we need more nutrient-dense food. I've spent the last couple days, and Laura and I just talked about this, on this volley of emails that people want a regenerative label now. Well, my whole thing, if you're going to have a regenerative label, it better be tied somehow in there to human nutrition or nutrient density of the product. You know, it has to be. Because none of the rest of this matters if it's not nutrient dense and done in a way that truly regenerates soils. Not just soils, the whole ecosystem I'm talking, but I often talk soils. Anyway, I got off on that. Um, I have actually two questions. Um, one, I wonder, I've heard, read and heard um, various farmers uh, talking about cattle um, coming up to GMO corn and yeah. not eating it. Do you think that's the same thing? They're feeling it with their whiskers, they're getting it? They're, they're, I'm just, this is Gabe's opinion, and I'm not a scientist, so... But I'll, I'll give you this analogy. I talk about all the deer on our place. I have a neighbor who thinks he's farming in Iowa because all he plants is corn and soybeans. That's all he plants, rotates every other year. Uh, here last year, we had a herd of about just under 100 deer that every night they had, lay, they had spend the day laying in his corn. At evening, they had walk over half a mile to eat my one 15-acre patch of open-pollinated corn. If that doesn't tell you something, I don't know what does. You know, that's the way it is. There, there's no doubt in my mind animals can sense it. And there, you know, I'm privy to a lot of uh, scientific information from overseas that gets sent to me where they're doing real research on GMOs and the effects on animals. According to the studies I've read, yes, they can, they can tell. You know, but you need, you know, I wish our scientists would tackle that. My other question, and it may have already been asked because I couldn't be here until the, the late, but I heard from Lloyd Willard who attended one of your workshops that you talked about just on a whim or I don't know, for whatever reason, deciding to throw your vegetable seeds into your cover crop. Maybe. Oh, well, what I actually did, there's David Brant in Ohio, Gail Fuller in Kansas and I, we kind of have a thing going, who can do the craziest thing each year? So we drew, you know, we spend all year planning these crazy things. And the one year what I did, I decided, well, what's a cover crop? You know, it's a diverse garden. So I took that year, I took 70 different species. I took my vegetable seeds, my cover crops, my flowers, mixed it all in a grain deal. As a matter of fact, earlier today, I showed a picture of those potatoes. That 30 acres surrounding those potatoes was that chaos garden, we called it. And we planted everything together. So there were 70 different species out there. Some come good, some not so good. And, you know, wife would ask what I wanted for dinner. Whatever she would trip over, that's what we'd eat, you know, because it was just a mad mess. But it worked. But you can't do that on a commercial scale because you couldn't harvest it. You know, you're just stepping on too much. But it, it created, you know, I definitely was the craziest that year. So that was a good thing, you know. Yeah, it's good to be crazy. Could you describe one more time how you... Yeah, what we do is we lay down a thin layer of compost, and then we just throw the potato seed, and all we do is just kind of walk with a bucket and flick them out, somewhat evenly spaced, and then we roll a bale of hay over it. Now, you, you can't let the hay be real thick. It needs to be thin, and then the potatoes will come up through the hay, and that's your weed barrier. Now, you will have to, have to add more hay on top of it, but then in the fall, whenever you want to harvest potatoes, you just peel that hay back. Potatoes are right there. Yeah, there will be some that'll get in the soil a little bit as that plant grows, but it works. Now, they will tend to be smaller than those that are in soil. But... Well, it's similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks for everyone for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.